Language classroom without interaction is no language classroom at all. Hi, my name is Princess Mailanga, and today I'm going to talk about interactive language teaching. After laying out our lesson, the next move is to step into the classroom and begin the process of stimulating interaction. We have to remember that we can never entice interaction if we deem to stick with the mechanical process of implementing our lesson because this makes our students inhibited in terms of expressing themselves in the class. Interaction is very essential for language teachers like us. As said, in the era of communicative language teaching, interaction is in fact the heart of communication. It is what communication is all about. But what is interaction on the very first place? As defined, interaction is the collaborative exchange of thoughts, feelings, or ideas between two or more people, resulting in reciprocal effect on each other. It means that there is mutuality of feelings, there is understanding among people who are conversing. Moreover, the importance of interaction is emphasized on various theories of communicative competence. I'm sure that you are familiar with these theories. Now, there are also different interactive principles. The first one we have, automaticity. Genuine interaction occurs when students have lower affective filters. Of course, no. when students are anxious, it prevents them from spontaneously using the target language. It's different when they are freed from the pressure of committing grammar errors and the judgment thereafter because they can exhibit automaticity in using the target language. And automaticity is accomplished when the focus is on meanings and messages, which results to automatic modes of processing linguistic inputs. The second principle is intrinsic motivation this is affected when students appreciate their own competence to use language when they feel the fulfillment while engaging themselves into various discourses they developed a system of self-reward no so their deepest drives are satisfied and we are characterizing here the intrinsic motivation of the students the third one we have, strategic investment. Because there are many ways of using and interpreting a language, interaction requires the use of strategic language competence. Moreover, this is also useful in repairing communication barriers. Thus, strategic competence is necessary for production and comprehension of meanings during the communication process the fourth one we have okay risk taking this refers to the risk of failing to result to the intended meaning of failing to comprehend the message of the one we are communicating with of being left at or being judged and rejected but of course the more we take risks in our language learning the greater the reward we come to yield. No? The fifth one we have language culture connection. Remember that language is culture and culture is language. The two of them are inseparable, no? So the type of interaction that occurs while communicating using the target language is contingent to the interlocutor's knowledge of the cultural nuances of the target language no. the sixth we have okay so inter language the more we engage ourselves with different interactions in different social settings the more we expose ourselves to the complexity of language yes no that's true this entails a long developmental process of acquisition while failures in production and comprehension are considered the teacher's 
facilitation and corrective feedback is crucial to the developmental process. All right. So the last principle we have, mm -hmm, we have communicative competence. The elements of communicative competence, which are already grammatical, discourse, social linguistic, pragmatic, and strategic competence are involved in human interaction. To arrive with successful communication, all of these elements should be taken into consideration. At this point in time, let's identify as well the roles of an interactive teacher. The first one we have, controller all right now if we talk about the traditional setting the teacher as the master controller determines everything that should occur in the classroom this includes when how and what students should speak and do because everything is controlled the teacher can somehow predict what would happen in the classroom although this is admirable in some respects in order for interaction to take place, the teacher should create a climate in which spontaneity can thrive. This means that unrehearsed language can be performed and thus freedom of expression is given to students. But, of course, this does not mean that control is not necessary at all. No? Control on the part of the teacher, no, on our part, it is still needed in carrying out interactive techniques. Remember that a wise controller is especially needed during the planning phase of the activity, for instance. Identifying directions and vis visualizing the implementation of the plan take careful control. This reflects the importance of teacher control, no? even in the most cooperative and interactive classrooms. The second role that we play is as director, all right? As students are engaged in either rehearsed or unrehearsed language performance, our job is to assure the efficient and smooth flow of the communication process. We direct the students to real-life discourses that they can most probably relate with, right? The next one is as manager. Manager because we keep students pointed toward the goals and engage in ongoing evaluation and feedback. So this is done through our preparation of the lessons to be delivered and the instructional materials to be utilized. Of course, no? This agrees with the idea of giving the students the opportunities to be spontaneous to showcase their uniqueness. The fourth one, we are facilitators too. No? This role requires us to step away from the managerial or directive role and allow students, no, with our guidance, to activate their own learning. This capitalizes on intrinsic motivation principle, no? the one that we discussed a while ago, wherein students discover language through using it pragmatically rather than by telling them about the language per se. The last one we have, yes, no? we are a resource as well. So students take the initiative to come to us, right? So, we are available for advice and counsel when our students need it. So, in this, the teacher, no, we become less directive, right? As the initiator of interaction, it's important to define our role first as part of the classroom interaction in general. So, without further ado, how to initiate interaction now there is this model called foreign language interaction or the flint model developed by gertrude muskowitz no so this gives some categories for observation of classes no in order for us to have an understanding on how to initiate 
and stimulate interaction in our classes. This is helpful because first, it gives us taxonomy for observing other teachers. This means that it makes us knowledgeable of the different hierarchy of communication that exists in the classroom. So, it gives us no, the options to check and choose from. And it also um, indicates the classroom time devoted to each activity that it has. The second one, it's helpful because it gives us framework for evaluating and improving our own teaching. So, for example, it gives us an idea how to balance teacher talk and student talk because if the goal is interaction, we teachers should not monopolize all the talkings in the classroom and leave our students in silence. On the other hand, when opportunities for our students to talk are given, it is still important that we facilitate the kind of talk necessary for the subject matter. The third one, no, it's helpful in setting a learning climate interactive for teaching. So it promotes a climate of cooperation by recognizing and openly accepting our students' individualization in terms of language learning. Okay, so this is the framework of the Flint model. So it is mainly divided into teacher talked and student talked. On one hand, teacher talked is also divided according to the teacher's influence. No, so it can be direct or indirect. In the direct influence, so the teacher can can give information, can correct without rejection, can give direction, can direct pattern drills, can criticize student behavior, can student can criticize student response. If it is indirect, so the teacher deals with feelings, praises or encourages no jokes or exhibits enthusiasm or humor no uses ideas of students no repeats student response and asks questions on the other hand we also have here the student talk so when we say student talk it pertains to how the student um responds to the teacher's initiation of um, interaction so it could be specific it could be also in choral no and the response itself could be open open-ended or initiated yes by the student himself or herself all right now on the other hand for us to provide stimuli for interaction it is also important to have knowledge and skills about the art of questioning. This is one of the best ways to develop our role as an initiator and sustainer of interaction. In a classroom where learners often do not have a great number of tools for initiating and maintaining language, our questions provide necessary stepping stones to communication. Appropriate questioning, no? appropriate questioning in an interactive classroom can fulfill a number of different functions. And the first one is that it gives opportunity to produce language comfortably without having to risk initiating language themselves. The second one, our questioning can serve to initiate a chain of reaction of student interaction among themselves right so it creates a domino effect no the third one our questioning can give instructor in uh, can give us no can give us immediate feedback about student comprehension of course we can never know if our students learn if they don't express it all right the last one it can provide students with opportunities to find out what they what they think by hearing what they say now 
there are many ways to classify what kind of questions are effective in classroom. Now, speaking of types, no, here are the categories of questions and typical classroom question words. So, you are very familiar with the Bloom's taxonomy. So, our questions as well no, are categorized according to the, this hierarchy. No? So, from knowledge, comprehension, application, analysis, synthesis, up to the highest um, level, which is evaluation. So, usually... The higher the proficiency level we teach, the more we can venture into the upper level of taxonomy. Although it is true that asking questions can help in having sound interaction, asking a lot of questions alone will not guarantee simulation of interaction. Okay? So we need to be careful as well in forming our questions. Right? So they should not be too vague or ambiguous and not too complex. So, let's also avoid too many oracle questions and even those random questions that have nothing to do with, your, with our discussion for they disturbed the thought patterns of our students. Okay? So, it is suggested that it's good as well to engage our students into various group works. Now we are done with the first step in creating an interactive classroom and that is characterizing our role as an initiator of the interaction. So we know how to get our students started and stimulate further communication. Now the bigger challenge is how to sustain this interaction through group work specifically. All right? But before we go further, let's actually define what group work is. Okay? Group work is a generic term covering a multiplicity of techniques in which two or more students are assigned a task that involves collaboration and self-initiated language. It is important to note that group work usually implies small group work that is, student in groups of perhaps six or fewer, no? Large groupings defeat one of the major purposes for doing group work, and that is giving students more opportunities to speak. Let's know the advantages of group work. Okay, so the first one, group work generates interactive language. Group work helps to solve the problem of classes that are too large to offer many opportunities to speak. It opens possibilities to come up with a variety of quality of interactive language. It's different from the traditional method that centers communication to the teacher. No? Using group work makes the whole class a group interlocutor. The second one, group work offers an embracing affective climate. Students feel less vulnerable when they are in a group with other students. They become a community of learners cooperating with one another in pursuit of common goal. Moreover, according to Maslow's hierarchy of needs, students tend to satisfy their security or safety need when they are in a group. This suggests that they can go on higher level of learning pursuit. The third advantage is group work promotes learner responsibility and autonomy. Group work makes classroom environment a lot comfortable, but of course, it places a responsibility for action and progress upon each of the members of the group somewhat equally. The last one, group work is a step toward individualized instruction. Group work addresses uniqueness among students and through it, students are given opportunities to showcase their individuality. Now, group works can be extremely helpful in achieving the goals of language class. However, it is also observed that few or some teachers avoid it. What could be the possible reasons why teachers avoid group work? No? So, saying no to group work. The first reason is 
the teacher is no longer in control of the class. This is experience when the teacher, especially when the class is large in number or when discipline issue is apparent in a particular class, no? Well, control here does not refer to that of a dictator who instead initiates creative interaction. He or she restricts it. Remember that this defeats the purpose of brickwork on the very first place. We pertain here to the adequate level of control necessary to still achieve sound interaction. So for this to happen, the teacher can play the role of rector, facilitator, or resource. Second, students will use their native language. So when students are left in a group, they might use their native language in discussion no? instead of the target language. Well, it's true. It's a lot easier to express themselves using the language they are most comfortable with. So, how can we assure that students will still use the target language even when the teacher is out of their sight? First, we have to demonstrate the importance of practicing the target language. So, let's appeal to various motivational factors to target their intrinsic motivation. It's useful as well to show how enjoyable it is to work together in achieving a goal. The third reason is that students' errors will be reinforced in small groups. So, we are concerned that when students are left on their own, we won't be able to correct them when they commit mistakes in using the target language. However, we need to understand that errors are necessary manifestation of interlanguage development. Group work encourages peer feedback anyway. Okay, so let's trust our students on this matter. The fourth one, we have teachers cannot monitor all groups at once. This is related with control issue. Surely, control and monitoring are necessary, but the goal is to provide students authentic experiences, right? So, it is not so bad to leave students to be in real communication. The last one, some learners prefer to work alone. So, this is related with learning style issue. Some learn better when they are in group, but some just don't. Now, to address this one, let's go back to the function of language on the very first place. Language is for communicating with people, right? Sometimes it is good to push people out from their comfort zone to see how far they can go. Okay, take note. There will always be circumstances that demand flexibility and resiliency. These are important in language learning too. And as language teachers, it is our job to make our students understand this one. So how do we implement group work? We need to be mindful of the implementation because group work can go wrong if it is not carefully planned well executed, monitored throughout, and followed up on in some way. So, the first step is selecting appropriate group techniques. Okay? So, we have here um, the some suggested tasks, no? And the first one is games. Our students love games, no? A game could any activity that formalizes a technique into units that can scored in some way so common language in cla common language classroom activities or guessing games no like charades for example okay so i know that you have experience playing charades the second one we have role play and simulation so role play is different from simulation on one hand, role play minimally involves giving a role to one or more members of a group and assigning an objective or purpose that participants must accomplish. For instance, one of the members will play as the teacher, 
while the other one will play as the student in a situation wherein the teacher counsels the students. So in the image here, so one play as the um, lawyer, no? So lawyer and this one, this kid here assumes that they're going to play doctor. Okay, so this is a very cute example of role playing. On the other hand, simulation usually involves a more complex structure and often large groups, no? So from 6 to 20 members, where the entire group is working through an imaginary situation as a social unit, the object of which is to solve some specific problem. For instance, all members of the group are shipwrecked on a desert island. Each member has been assigned an occupation such as doctor, musician, engineer, teacher, etc. Only a specified subset of the group can survive on remaining food supply. So, the group must decide who will live and who will die. Okay? The third suggested task is drama. So, this is more formalized form of role play or simulation with a pre-planned storyline and script. So, this is often referred to as a skit. Fourth, we have projects. This is a hands-on approach to language. For example, we can actually require our students to come up with an infographic, a research paper, or a module, perhaps. We also have interview. This is also beneficial to increase language proficiency. Okay, So this can be done for pair work, but also appropriate for group work. Students can learn appropriate responses to various questions that can be personal or something related with their academics. Next, we have brainstorming. This is a technique whose purpose is to initiate some sort of thinking process. No? So the aim is to generate ideas as many as possible by the students. This is very helpful to develop fluency and at the same time, spontaneity of the students. In brainstorming, all ideas are legitimate and the real challenge is to choose the better ones from the pool of ideas. Next, we have information gap. This includes a tremendous variety of techniques in which objective is to convey or to request information. The two focal characteristics of information gaps techniques or their primary attention to information and not to language forms. So the focus is not on grammar and structure, for example. And the second one, the necessity of communicative interaction in order to reach objective. So the information that students must seek can range from very simple to complex. So for beginners, Students may be required to find out one another's personal information. No? This way, they can converse with one another. Now, for advanced classes, we can ask our students' opinions regarding the author's purpose for writing a literature piece, for example. All right? We also have jigsaw. Jigsaw techniques are special forms of information gap in which each member of a group is given some specific information and the goal is to pull all information to achieve some objectives. One very popular jig jigsaw technique that can be used in larger groups is known as a strip story. So in this, the teacher, the teacher takes a moderately short written narrative or conversation and cuts each sentence of the text into a little strip shuffles the strips and gives each student a strip the goal is for students to determine where each of their sen sentences belongs in the whole context of the story or stand in their position once it is determined and to read off the reconstructed story no students enjoy this technique and almost always find it challenging okay we also have 
problem solving and decision making. This focuses on groups solutions to a specific problem. Now, problem solving involves decision making as well, no? These two are inseparable. For example, the activity might involve a crime story wherein students are going to identify whether or not the suspect is guilty. Further, activity may involve political or moral dilemma. So we can insert here a debate activity, no? Lastly, we have opinion exchange. An opinion is usually a belief or feeling that might not be founded on empirical data or that others could, possi could possibly take issue with. So giving opinions may be difficult for beginners. But of course, if they can already give one, then much better. We just need to be careful and sensitive in asking for our students' opinions because of course, opinions are influenced by our personal biases and culture. So, we need to foster open-mindedness and respect toward other people's culture to avoid misunderstanding. With that, let's proceed to the second step, and that is planning the group work. The most common reason for the breakdown of group work is an inadequate introduction and lead-in to the task itself. No? Sometimes we just assume that everything is okay and that our students already get all the instructions. So we remain complacent, only to find out at the end there are many problems that exist. So what is the supposed step after selecting the type of activity that students must do? To answer this question, here are the steps. And the first one is to introduce the technique. So this includes telling the students the purpose of the activity. So tell them the steps they need to take to complete the activity, of course. The second one, justify the use of small groups for the technique. Some teachers tend to overlook this part, especially when students do not raise questions. No, But Despite this, it is important to explain to them the necessity of the group to accomplish the task. Characterize the opportunities they will have during the implementation. So they have to understand why they need to do the activity on the very first place. And take note that there would be a difference on the performance of the students when they know the type of learning that they will gain at the end of the lesson or at the end of the activity. Next is, we need to model the technique. So we need to be explicit in making sure students know that they are what they are supposed to do. This is especially needed for students who have not done the activity before. We can model the activity ourselves or we can select students to do it on our behalf with our guidance as well. Next, we need to give explicit detailed instructions. It is so much better to give students guidelines in completing the task. Consider as well all possible problems they may encounter and your suggestions about it. Next, we have divide a class into groups. In doing this, consider the strengths and weaknesses of the students. Next, check for clarification. So do not just say, do you understand? No, so it would be much better to ask one student or to, to restate your instructions. Last, we have set the task in motion. So this is literally giving a go signal to the students to go to their group and get the task started. The last step is monitoring the task. Okay, so our job now is that of a facilitator and resource. So we need to inform the students that we are always available for advice and suggestion. We can also take our rounds to check the progress of the task and their language production. Now, after the completion of the task, group work can be brought to a beneficial close by some sort of class debriefing. So debriefing has two layers. Okay, so the first one, we have reporting on task objectives. So this involves reporting of the group's findings of the task done. While groups are reporting their findings, we may as well um, give 
some brief discussion but we need to be aware of the time as well in order to not steal time from other groups the second one establishing effective support from being with a group this is the last time we bring the class together again as a whole community of learners so it is also good to ask about the students feedback on the activity we may as well give encouragement to students for them to become proactive in terms of their language learning so yes that ends my presentation as a review i talked about how to foster interaction in a language classroom and interaction is very essential for a cohort of communication it gives us a picture of our students progress in learning the target language as the main goal it also helps us in identifying our students strengths and weaknesses in undertaking the subject matter furthermore it is important to take note how to initiate interaction and also how to sustain it all throughout the development of the class okay so for questions you can ask me do not hesitate um but for now thank you and bye bye